Zach. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being on time. We were waiting a little bit more, but I really appreciate your promptness. Um, I always struggle with how I start and how mountains are so difficult. So I have a small little clip that saves me the hassle of explaining to you how mountains is, and then I'll tell you my story. So bear with me one second. Just, just see my clip, and then I'll come on again and share my story, okay? I'm afraid, I'm afraid of losing my life to the mountain and not returning to my family. But I'm also afraid of not really living. I asked my father permission to climb mountains and his response was a quiet, no. From the moment I opened my eyes, I was a dreamer. Until the moment they close, I'll strive to realize them. What I fear the most is what moves me. And up there I fight my demons. My fear of giving up far exceeded my fear of the mountain because I would not accept the shadow of myself. It's my dream to see a generation of girls where there are no longer any firsts because all of them have been conquered. And if by sharing my story, I can help even one girl inch closer to her dreams, then my efforts would have been worthy. I climb so that the only mountains the next generation of women scale out of rock and ice. And the only weight they carry is a trophy. And the only lines they face are the finish lines. This is why I climb. Thank you. Thank you so much. I always struggle with where to start my story. And I'd love to give you a deep, profound reason to look really cool. But the truth is, it started with the word no. Just no. Such a small two-letter word that has the power to enrage the spirit and fuel the soul. It's a two-bladed sword that can either hurt you or heal you. You see, the best thing anyone has ever told me once was a very quiet no. I never thought such a negative comment could open so many big, beautiful doors. Where do I start with the story I never thought I would tell? I honestly never thought I would be able to tell my story. But I guess I'm gonna start from the beginning. I was born in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, to a father who always taught me to reach for the stars, and a mother whose spirit I inherited. According to my dad, you and your mom, same, same. Exactly. I don't know if that's a compliment or a diss. It depends on the day of the week. And from a very young age, from, since I was tiny, I was eccentric. I was different. I was one of those children that was always an oddball. And at home, I was surrounded with love. I was surrounded by acceptance and approval in my own family. But as soon as I stepped out of my home, as soon as I stood in society, I was surrounded by social expectations of what a Saudi girl should be. So for the longest time, I tried to fit inside that little box. I really tried to fit inside that box everyone is trying to fit me in. But I couldn't, because there was something in my heart that told me I was destined for more. There was something in my heart that told me I would live a bigger life than they expected me to live. So I reached a point in my life, and this point is a specific age that every single woman reaches in her life. This age differs from culture to culture, from family to family. In my case, it was a few years ago, I hit that age number and I was expected to live a, a very traditional lifestyle. I had two options in my, in, my, in my life. I had in one hand to go after this crazy thing I was looking for, to feed my soul, to find this drive I knew that was pulling me. And on the other hand, 
I had the more traditional lifestyle of going from wedding to wedding, waiting for Prince Charming to come and sweep me off my feet and ride across the sunset. <laughs> Now, ladies, I mean no insult. This might be the perfect life for most. It's what I want, too. But at the time, as fate might have it, I wasn't meant to walk that path. Actually, I wasn't meant to walk a path at all. I was meant to climb one. I reached that conclusion that I needed an adventure. I reached that conclusion that I will find an adventure. So I spent hours online Google searching, trying to find this thing. I didn't even know what it was. Do you know how hard it is to look for something you don't even know what it is? And I nearly gave up. I nearly said, Raha, why the heartache? Why? Khali, let mama find you some nice guy to marry you. Khalas, you know, why? Why the heart? Why are you trying to find this life that everyone thinks you shouldn't have? I nearly gave up, but I didn't. I kept looking, and I, my heart was so open for the world. And I was, I was rewarded. I was sitting one day randomly with a group of women. Actually, it was a mix of people. I didn't even know them at the time, and I was sitting there. And one of them said, I'm climbing Kilimanjaro in Africa. And as soon as she said that, I looked at her and I said, you're what? She said, I'm climbing a mountain in the Eid Break. And she was from the region. So I looked at her and I said, Timajnoon, are you crazy? She said, no, no, I'm climbing a mountain. At that point, I didn't even know what Kilimanjaro was. I honestly thought it was a fruit. I had no idea that it was the highest mountain in Africa. But as soon as she said climbing, as soon as she said, I will climb, that little flicker in my heart I told you about, that little calling in my heart pulsed. And I knew I found something. So I went back home, and I Google searched, and I found what it is. It's the highest peak in Africa. And the more I read about it, the more I thought, this is perfect. It's outdoorsy. It's travel. It's dangerous. It's perfect. It's a great thing I found to tell my parents, I don't want to go down that path, right? But it's not enough to have an idea. It's not enough to have a dream. I'm still a Saudi woman. I need the conviction to fight for what I wanted. I need the strength to be scrutinized and not be faced. And I needed the courage to call my father. <laughs> I couldn't just go climb a mountain. So blessed, it was a blessed thing that my, I was in Dubai. My dad was in Jeddah. So it was a phone conversation. Thank God it wasn't a face-to-face -face conversation, because I think if it was face-to-face, -face, it would have ended up completely different. I called him. As soon as the phone rang, he picked up. I said, hi, daddy. And my father, knowing me so well, he said, what did you do? What did you break? What's wrong? Do you want money? What's wrong? I said, no, everything is fine. Alhamdulillah, you know, kullu tamam. But I've decided to climb the highest peak in Africa, and it's in Tanzania, and it takes six days. And I went on like a broken Wikipedia page because I was so nervous to stop because I was so afraid to hear what he says. But finally, when, when I finished the Wikipedia page and I took a breath, I heard it. He just said, no. It was the quietest, loudest noise I ever heard in my life. He just said, no, Habibti, no. Not wanting to overstep my lines, not wanting to, to insult him, I said, OK, Daddy. I hung up, went home, and couldn't sleep. That small two-letter word grew in my mind, and it swelled till it had clung, cl claws, and it was clawing at me. It, it just drove me crazy that he told me no. It enraged me that he said no. And I decided to, to calm my heart and mind to write a letter that I was never going to send, as all great letters start. I said, I'm going to uh -huh, write it down. I hear when you write something down, you feel better about it. So fell, and I sat down, and I started to write the, the, the letter. And I'm severely dyslexic, so I was typing like this. And I put every single thing he taught me straight at him. I told him, Baba, who do you think made me believe I can climb this mountain? Who made me think I could actually touch this guy? You did. You are the person that made me believe in myself. And you're telling me no now because I'm a girl. If I was Muhammad, my brother, you would have said yes. You would have bought him the ticket. But I was born Raha, a female. Why would you do this to me now? You told me I can fly, but not too high. You told me I can touch the sky, but only within the limits of your, of your gender bias. I said, I can't do this to myself. 
I really want to climb this mountain. And I checked, I spell checked, and like I said, I was dyslexic. By the time I finished, the sun had come up, and I was standing there in the draft. I decided to send it to him. I had my finger on the send button, and I was frozen. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been on 14 expeditions across seven continents. I've seen things I can't even imagine you would imagine. I've seen life, I've seen death. And that moment, with my finger on the send button, was one of the scariest moments of my life. And I've seen people lose their lives on mountains. Took a deep breath and press send. Now again, I'd love to tell you that I went to bed and everything was good, <laughs> but the reality was I ran around myself like a crazy person thinking, oh my God, Raha, what have you done? Bob is going to send Muhammad, my brother, in a box with a bow and he's going to give me to the first Aris and he's going to go, la, 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 la. take her, money be her. I thought, oh, oh, I thought I dug my grave by sending that email, but I sent it anyway. And to add to the drama, to add to the pain, my dad, who speaks to me almost every day, ignored me. Tanlashni. <laughs> my dad ignored me. We usually talk all the time. He ignored me. And it drove me crazy. Uh, and we always fight. Uh, we always argue. He says, it was only a few days, Ya Raha. I say, no, it was 10 days. We always have this thing. And I, I need to check the email. But we can't decide how long it was. But anyway, throughout those silent, I call them the silent days. samita. The silent days. I was calling my mom, ha, mama, like an insider training. Ha, mama, do you know anything? Baba, Baba told you something. She's like, no, I don't know what you did. <laughs> this is your thing. He's been very, very quiet. I don't know what you did. So I was afraid. I was emotional. I was all the emotions you can think of. But I never felt regret. Not once did I feel regret. Not once. And that's when I knew how much this meant to me. But alhamdulillah, at the end of those agonizing silent days, I got a reply. <laughs> I sent him a phone book. Please remember that I sent my dad a phone book. He replied with one sentence. One. He said, you're crazy. I love you. Go for it. Little did either of us know how much this simple sentence would change my life. One sentence. And of course, I called him. I said, ha, Baba, Akid, are you sure? He's like, yes, but you need to call your mother because I don't know what to tell her. Alhamdulillah, I trained, I think, I think before Kili, I thought camping was a four-star hotel. I had no idea what camping was. But alhamdulillah, I had a background in sports. So I trained myself, I got the gear, and I went on Kilimanjaro. And surely enough, a few weeks later or a month later, I was standing on top of Africa's roof. And I was seeing the world with such beautiful proximity to the heavens. And I knew this would not be the last time I tasted what a summit feels like. I can't explain to you how it felt to belong to a place I've never been before. I felt like I belonged on top of the world in the middle of ice, but I was born in the desert. But it felt so right. It felt so bigger than me. And I knew I wasn't going to stop. I knew that this would be my calling. And fell, and I came back home. I was hyperthermic. I was uh, snow bitten. I looked like a wet cat that was left out for too long. And I walked into my parents' house with the biggest smile on my face. And my mom and my dad looked at me and said, uh oh. And uh oh was right. I went crazy with mountains. I kept doing one mountain after the other, after the other. And haram, every time I go to a mountain, me and my dad have the same thing. We have a discussion, we have a proposal. Every time it's the same thing. And just when I thought I found my limits, just when I thought, okay, Raha, you've reached the top of your crazy imagination, just when I thought, khalas, I was ready to go back and find Darius, I saw Everest with my own eyes. I saw that mountain for the first time with my own eyes. And I was in love. My mother jokes, my mom says, inshallah, one day I hope my daughter looks at that mountain the same way she looks at a man. I hope one day she finds someone makes her like this eyes, heart eyes. She says heart eyes. Because really, I was in love with that mountain. The girl from Jeddah was in love with the highest mountain in the world. Can you imagine how crazy that is? And surely enough, I came back from, from uh, base camp and I decided to climb Everest. And it took me 12 months, eight mountains, and a lot of emails and conversation with my parents, and a year. And I found myself, this girl born in the desert, 
born in Jeddah, me, taking my last final steps towards the highest mountains in the world. And it didn't matter that I was a Saudi woman. It didn't matter that I was Arab. It didn't matter that I was female, the color of my skin. Nothing mattered other than the fact that I believed I could touch the sky. I truly believed I could. And Felon, I found myself standing on the highest mountain. I literally stood on top of the world. A Saudi woman stood on top of the world. And when I came back down from Everest and I got all the attention and all the media drama that followed, I felt very small, I felt very insignificant. I kept saying, I climbed the mountain. Who cares about the mountain? There are so many bigger things in life. And I felt like what I did was a selfish act rather than a selfless one. But all that flew out of the window a day, the day, this little girl told me that my crazy notion of climbing Everest gave her the courage to ride a bicycle. Now, a lot of you might not know that in Saudi, up to 2013, women were not allowed to ride bicycles. So this little girl told me, I will ask my father for a bicycle because if you can climb that mountain, I can choose what I do. And that meant the world to me. I'm often asked, why would a desert-born Arab woman attempt such infamous mountains? And the truth is, I'd love to give you a deep, profound reason to look really cool. But it's simply because I believed I could. I didn't care about being youngest first or history. I would have still climbed it had I been the oldest anonymous nobody. All I wanted was to prove to myself that, that I could attempt the impossible and maybe even achieve it. And I have to tell you, it feels fantastic to prove people wrong from on top of the world. It feels great. And in the end, if you walk out of these doors and completely forget this crazy woman who's in love with mountains, I want you to remember that a Saudi woman stood on top of the world. I was born in the sand, but I touched the sky. So never let your dreams feel too far from reach. Let your dreams be a reflection of the endlessness of your capabilities. Be bold, be brave, because after all, ladies and gentlemen, history is never made by the faint-hearted. Thank you. Sorry, I get really emotional. Thank you so much. You've been a really, really awesome crowd. Um, I always like to open the, the floor up to Q&A because a lot of people are very curious. And the better the questions are, the better I look. So don't leave me hanging. Please don't be shy. If you have any questions about climbing or about uh, passion or how, how to get to where you are, please ask. There's a mic somewhere. Or you can just ask. Raise your hand <laughs> and ask. Oh, very shy. <laughs> I covered oh, everything, I guess. Well, please be in touch with me. I'm in social media, uh, Raham Harrag. You know it's me because it's, my spelling mistakes are horrendous. So if you have any questions about climbing or about training or about any of the things I do, please be in touch. And yeah, you've been great. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you have a question. Uh, I have a question. Was there a time that you wanted to give up? What's that? <laughs> Uh, the question was, was there a time where I wanted to give up? Honestly, no. I never felt like I was going to give up. I'm not the type that can, but there's a difference between giving up and knowing your limits. So at some point in time, I was doing a very, very tough mountain, which is my last mountain, the seventh mountain. It was in Alaska. And the weather was bad, the team was sick. I had lost all of my toenails, half of my eyebrows and eyelashes, and I had an ulcer in my tummy, and I knew I had to go home. But I went back two years later and climbed the mountain. So I, I don't believe in giving up. I just believe in knowing your limits. The, and the, the thing that pushed me the most is the fact that, A, very few people get to, to live the dream that I lived. And B, I have two parents that lived in terror to let me go. So I wasn't going to just come back easily. But the most important thing is to know your limits. That's the most important thing in mountain climbing, I think in life as well. Good question. <laughs> Thanks. So be in touch if you need anything. Thank you so much. <laughs>